Hey guys, we're going to continue on our formula writing and naming journey today with ternary ionic bonds. We're going to stop with start with type 1 ternary ionic bonds. This means we're going to use something called polyatomic ions. Vocabulary you should know, uh, ternary tertiary, we'll talk about those, polyatomic ions, monatomic ions. After this lesson, you should be able to find polyatomic ions and their charges. Write the formulas for type 1 and type 2, sorry, ternary ionic bonds, and name type 1 and type 2 ternary ionic bonds. So let's talk about these. There's some pictures here of uh, polyatomic ions. Basically, these are ions, so the whole thing has a charge but it's made up of more than one atom. We've uh, been looking at ions that are only made up of one type of element, like lithium with a one plus charge, magnesium with a two plus charge. These instead have more than one type of element in them, but the entire thing has a charge, the entire ion. So vocab, type one ternary tertiary ionic bond. It has three or more elements in the compound. That's why it's ternary or tertiary. You'll see both words, okay? Its cation is a representative metal from the S group or the P group, the metal, and it's positive. Its negative anion is going to be a polyatomic ion, and we'll talk about where to find those in a minute. So it might look something like NaOH. So you can see you have three different elements in here instead of the two you've been looking at the last few days. A monatomic ion consists of only one element. Sorry about the S there. Example, lithium with a one plus charge or magnesium with a two minus charge. Whereas a polyatomic ion consists of two or more elements all together with a charge. For example, hydroxide is OH and the whole thing has a one negative charge. So really, you can kind of look at it. Oops, turn on my drawing pad here. Uh, you can kind of look at it, and we'll talk about this more in a second, as this hydroxide. Oops. Is this hydroxide is kind of in a little box here and the whole thing has one minus charge or you've got ammonium and h4 with a one plus charge so that's a polyatomic ion let's talk about where you can find these you guys have a chemistry cruncher i've given you my apex kids um, i'm going to go ahead and reattach it to uh, this lesson so um, I would highly recommend using this. You can find polyatomic ion charts on the internet, though. I'm really fine with either. Um, this one's just got fewer on them, so it's easier to find stuff. I'm not making you guys memorize polyatomic ions this year. Um, 2020 is hard enough as it is, and we have them available to you, so I don't see the point in memorizing them at this point. Um, I'll, if, if there's one you're looking for that's not on there, simply look it up online. Um, a couple of things that you do have to kind of know. All polyatomics that we use are cations. Oh gosh, did I put that? I meant they're all anions. Let me fix that. Totally ignore that. Do, do, do. Cross that out. Anions. So negative anions with one exception. You need to memorize it. It's on your chem cruncher, but it's going to be easier for you if you memorize it. It's down here. We don't usually use hydronium until much later, so you really only have to worry about NH4 ammonium with a one plus charge. So you've got to remember that that's a polyatomic too. Um, another note, something to be aware of, uh, hydrogen carbonate right here, and then hydrogen sulfate right here. Uh, basically, if they have two words and start with hydrogen, they're also known as bi. So Hydrogen carbonate is the same as bicarbonate. You can make note of that on your chem cruncher if you'd like. Um, hydrogen sulfate is known as bisulfate, as you're going to see those alternate terms for them sometimes, so that way you know that they're there. All right, let's talk about writing formulas for these type 1 ternary ionic bonds. Here's the deal. A polyatomic ion stays together. Pretend it's in a box. So. If we look at our chem cruncher, um, let's look at something like carbonate, um, which is, let's use this pad instead, which is uh, CO3. Okay, so that means in this polyatomic 
ion, we have one carbon and three oxygens. The entire thing has a charge of two negative. You cannot mess with a subscript that's already there. So when we are writing formulas, you cannot change that subscript. If you take that three away or try to change it, it's no longer carbonate. So in order for this to be carbonate, it has to be CO3, and the whole thing has a two minus charge. Just like if you have, um, let's say, PO4. You cannot mess with that four. It belongs to it. It's saying that in that um, ion, you have one phosphorus and you have four oxygens. Okay? And the whole thing has a charge of three minus. So picture them. If you want to draw a box around them, I don't care, but picture them in a box so you don't mess with those um, uh, subscripts. All right, so we're still going to use the crisscross method. Um, if we bring a subscript down after a polyatomic ion, we're going to have to use parentheses, and we'll talk about what that looks like here. So let's do our first example using magnesium hydroxide. So we're still going to do this, where we write our, ah, sorry, I'm having some trouble with my little pad here. All right, hang on. I don't know what's going on. Okay, so magnesium, two plus charge. One, two, three, skip, three, two, one, six. So we know that. Now, magnesium hydroxide. If it's not on the periodic table, or it ends in eight, or eight, we can generally know that we're going to find that on the polyatomic ion chart. So look at your polyatomic ion chart, and you're going to find that hydroxide is OH, and it has a one negative charge. So again, I want you to at least pretend that this is in a box and you can't mess with it. So now we're just going to do our crisscross method like usual. But what we're doing is we're bringing down this two after the entire OH. So this is really important, and this is where most people lose points. Mg, and we're not going to worry about bringing down that one, but we have OH. And if we bring that 2 down after just the H, that means in this we have one magnesium atom, one oxygen atom, and two hydrogen atoms. That's incorrect. We brought that 2 down after, over the, after this whole ion. So what we have to do is we have to put that polyatomic ion in parentheses. So now if we look at this, we kind of distribute the two. So we have one magnesium, we have two oxygens, because two times one is two. Then we have two hydrogens, two times one is two. So that's a whole different thing than if we left off the parentheses. So it's important that you put those parentheses there if you bring down a subscript after a polyatomic ion. All right, let me um, erase that and give us a little bit of room. And let's look at the next one. The next one is aluminum phosphate. So we have aluminum. And we know aluminum, one, two, three, skip, three, two, one, zip, has a three plus charge. And then looking at our polyatomic, we know it's a polyatomic because it ends in eight. Okay, most of them do end in eight or eight. A couple examples, hydroxide, cyanide, but mostly eight or eight. So that should tip us off right there. So let's find phosphate. Phosphate is PO, PO4, and it has a three negative charge. So pretend it's in a box. Again, I don't care if you draw the box, but it helps you think about it. And what we have here is we've got a three plus on aluminum. We have a three minus on uh, phosphate. So we know that those are just going to kind of cancel each other out. And what we're going to be left with is Al. PO4. There's no need to put parentheses here because we didn't pull a subscript out. All right, let's look at the next one. Get this out of the way. And we're going to look at ammonium acetate. Do you guys remember what I told you about ammonium? It is our one and only um, positive cation polyatomic. It is NH4 with a one plus charge. On your polyatomic sheet, if you just see a plus or a minus, it means one plus. Ugh, sorry. It means one plus or one minus. So be aware of that. Oh my gosh. Hang on, guys, bear with me. I don't know what's going on here. Okay, that's NH4 with a one plus charge. Then we need to find acetate. 
and zinate, so we know it's a polyatomic. And if you look here, C2H3O2. H3O2, it's acetate, and it has a one negative charge. That one positive and one negative are just going to cancel out here. So our formula is going to be NH4C2H3O2. That whole thing is ammonium acetate. Again, we didn't need parentheses because we didn't bring a number down. All right, two more of these, and then we'll move on to the next part. Let's do sodium hydrogen phosphate. All right, so we know sodium is a metal, so we have Na, and we know it's charge, 1 plus. Now, hydrogen phosphate, that eight tells you. So what we're not going to do is we're not going to say, oh, hydrogen's H, let's throw that in there, and then let's throw phosphate in there. It's not how this works, okay? After the metal, the rest of it is a polyatomic. So let's look for hydrogen phosphate. And what we find is HPO4. with a two negative charge. Now all we have to do is our crisscross, bring our numbers down. So Na is going to get the two. And then HPO4 gets the one, which we don't need to write. That is your sodium hydrogen phosphate. Okay, so yes, I know it ended up with an H and a PO4. But don't mess with it that way because then you'll end up trying to do weird charges and stuff. Keep in mind, Anything after the metal is a polyatomic. All right, last one is calcium hypochlorite. All right, hypo doesn't have anything really to do with hydrogen in a sense. So again, it's a polyatomic. So we know calcium's our metal. Whatever's left over is that polyatomic. It ends in ite. So if we look at hypochlorite, CLO, with a one minus charge, okay? So all we do is we're gonna do our crisscross. Now, CA is not gonna get anything because it's a one. And then we have ClO four. Does this look correct to you guys? Think about what I'm missing here. Or not four, I'm so sorry. Two. So what am I missing? I brought that two down after CLO, not just O. So I'm going to have to put my parentheses here. Those parentheses are a killer for you guys sometimes, so make sure you use them. All right, I hope those make sense. Let's go on to naming these polyatomic ions. Um, ternary ionic nomenclature. This is so easy, really. You name the cation, then you name the anion, which is your polyatomic. Don't change the ending this time. So, straight up, magnesium is our metal, our cation. And then the rest of it, whatever is left over after the metal, is going to be our polyatomic. So we have OH, we know the two came from the magnesium. So we're looking for OH. Look on your polyatomic ion chart, and we find out that's hydroxide. So magnesium hydroxide. Right here, NH4. Don't forget that guy. That is our um, cation that's a polyatomic, ammonium. And then what's left over is SO4, sulfate. Okay? All right, Na2C2O4, sodium is our first element, so that is our, um, our metal. So we've got. Yeah, sorry about that. Sodium. Then let's look at what's up left over. C2O4. Look at your polyatomic ion chart. See if you can find C2O4. And what you're going to find is that it's called oxalate. And then one last one here. We have aluminum. It's our metal, first element. Whatever is left over is our polyatomic. We're going to look for PO3, and PO3 is called phosphite. I hope you guys find that part super easy because you don't have to change any endings or anything. All right, 
Now I am going to go on to um, type two in just a minute. So bear with me. All right, let's talk about type two ternary ionic bonds. Those are your polyatomics, this time with transition metals as your cations instead of representative metals. All right, let's talk type two ternary ionic bonds where your cation, your positively charged ion is a transition metal and your negatively charged ion, your anion is a polyatomic ion. We're gonna talk about writing formulas for these type two ternary ionic bonds. We're gonna to continue to crisscross and we're gonna to continue to use parentheses as needed. So not much has really changed. So let me just get this down here and let's talk about first cobalt two dichromate. So what we learned from this is the two tells us the charge on your transition metal. Now we need to look up dichromate on our polyatomic ion chart. Dichromate is Cr2O7. Remember, we can't mess with any of this. It is what it is. That is dichromate. It has a charge of two negative. So we've already figured out that if we have a two plus and a two negative, let's just cross them out there. And then we will just write our formula, CO, Cr2, O7. So that is cobalt 2 dichromate's formula. All right, let's look at iron 4 sulfate. Again, the 4 tells us the charge on our transition metal. And then we look up sulfate. Sulfate is SO4 with a 2 minus charge. Now, because we know that we're going to be able to simplify this, let's just do this here because we have a 4 and a 2. So let's just put a 2 here and a 1 there. So 2 goes into 4 twice, it goes into 2 once. And then if we do our crisscross, it just saves us a little time. And we'll do Fe. Then we've got to do parentheses because we're going to bring a number down after our SO4, 2. And that is our formula for iron 4 sulfate. Last but not least, let's take a look at copper phosphate. Now, we know copper is a transition metal. That's the first thing you should be asking yourself. Is copper a transition metal? Yes, it is. Okay, but there's no Roman numeral. So do you guys remember what the charge we have to assume it is? We're going to assume it's one if there's, if there's no Roman numeral. Sometimes they'll put the one, sometimes they won't. So we know our copper here has a one plus charge. We're going to look up phosphate, which is PO4 with a three negative charge. So our formula, we're just going to do our crisscross, Cu3PO4. Okay, so not much has really changed. Crisscrosses, parentheses where needed. And let's move on and go ahead and write formula, or sorry, write names. So nomenclature for type 2 ternary ionic bonds. First thing we'll do is we'll name the transition metal. We'll put the charge of the transition metal as a Roman numeral in parentheses like we did for binary. And then we're going to name our polyatomic ion. And again, for a polyatomic ion, we don't change the ending at this point. So let's take a look at this guy. We have PbCO32. Well, we need to find out. So we know we have lead, something in parentheses, and CO3 is carbonate. So you know anytime you have more than two elements in your formula, you should be looking at the polyatomic ion chart after you look at your metal. So we need to figure out what goes in parentheses here. So let's go back and write down lead. We have, according to the formula, we have one lead and we have two CO3s. Well, we know the charge on each CO3 from our chart is two minus. So that means that we have a total four negative charge. Well, then we know our charge on uh, this side has to be four positive because our overall charge, our net ionic charge is always going to be zero. But we only have one lead to apply that to. So we know that lead has to be oops, four plus. Pen. Sorry. So lead four carbonate. All right, let me erase that so I have a little more room. And 
and let's take a look at SN3PO42. Well, we have more than two elements in here, so we know we're going to be dealing with a polyatomic after we look at our metal. Our metal is tin. Now, remember, tin is not in the D block, but that's one of those exceptions, so we know it's a polyatomic ion. So we're looking at tin something. So we've got to have that Roman numeral. And PO4 is phosphate. All right, so let's look at what our charge on tin here is. Well, we know we have three tins, and we know we have two phosphates. Each PO4 has a two neg or sorry, three negative charge, giving us a total of six negative on this side. So we need six positive on this side. So that means that we could split it into these three, and we'll get two positive for each one. So, we are going to have tin 2 phosphate. And a lot of you guys will be able to pretty much do that in your head at this point, which is fine. You don't have to show all that, but it's very helpful. All right, here we have ZnSO3. Well, we do know something about zinc. We learned that zinc always, always, always has a plus two charge. All right, that looks a little funky. And this should confirm it here for us. So let's see, we have one zinc, we have one SO3. SO3 has a two negative charge, so that total side has two negative. This side has a two positive, and zinc sticks with its zinc two. Oops, and I wrote SO3 instead of sulfite. Let me change that there. So zinc to sulfite. All right, hopefully that um, helps you guys. And let me know if you have any questions that I can help you with. And I will see you soon.